I'm Lita Mack. In this interview series for Co-op Month, which is October, we are exploring the world of cooperatives. Greenbelt is a good place to look for cooperatives. We have a cooperative nursery school, credit unions, a co-op food store, a cafe, co-op housing, a co-op newspaper, and even a healthcare cooperative. And in fact, the city itself uses a purchasing cooperative to get supplies. When we see a need in Greenbelt, we often think about how could we meet that need through a cooperative. And we often say that to be successful in forming a cooperative, you need two things. You need a need. There has to be something you have to address. And you need leaders to help carry out that idea. Today, I'm very excited. We're talking with members of the Greenbelt Co-op Incubator Group people who have been thinking about forming new cooperatives to meet the needs of Greenbelt. They recently got a grant from the Greenbelt Community Foundation, and that will help them form their cooperatives. With me today are Lori Rosenthal, Caitlin McGrath, Maggie Cahalan, Tim Cohen-Mitchell, and Kim Keyes. And we also have another cooperative that couldn't be with us today, uh, the Greenbelt Early Learning Cooperative, Karen Lambright Davis, and others who are working on that. So today I want to just chat with um, all of these members of the Greenbelt Co-op Incubator Group and find out what are their thoughts about their potential cooperative. And first I'm going to ask each of you to tell us, you know, what cooperative you're thinking of forming. And let me start with Maggie. What do you want to do? Okay. I'm Maggie Cahalan, and the co-op that I'm interested in, um, we're calling the Healthy Eco Yards Co-op. This is a co-op that um, has as a mission to support um, households and businesses and um, public spaces in having um, landscapes that uh, demonstrate organic land care and really more bay friendly, Chesapeake Bay, watershed bay friendly ways of landscaping. So we're interested in organic land care <coughs> and we're also interested in um, really fostering the best practices for um, organic land care that have been put out there. So a good, a good thing for Greenbelt and also for the state and for actually the whole Chesapeake Bay watershed. Right, right, right. Yes. Laurie, what are you thinking of? Yes, so I'm Laura Rosenthal, and I'm with the Greenbelt Compost Co-op. And our goal is to uh, reduce the amount of food scraps that leave Greenbelt and go to the landfill, and instead compost them within the city limits, which will provide rich soil for people to grow food for the, the HACO um, <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, Co-op to use. And other, other, there's many uses for compost, not only for growing fruits and vegetables, but even for improving our highways. Improving our highways? Yeah, that's right. That's oh, right. we have to come back to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot, of, lot to hear about how you improve your highways with compost. But uh, let me ask Caitlin, what are you thinking of doing? So I'm Caitlin McGrath, and I am uh, working on the idea of a workers' cooperative, the Greenbelt Cinema Cooperative, which would be the, um, the arm that would work on um, running the Greenbelt Theater when it reopens. So I've started the Friends of Greenbelt Theater, which would be the nonprofit arm that would do the fundraising, and the Workers Cooperative would be the group that would actually do the operations of the theater. Exciting. And that's something that um, certainly everybody will be looking for to see how the theater, when it finally, the grand reopening after the renovations, how it is run. Um, Tim, you have some ideas too. Sure, I'm uh, Tim Cohen Mitchell, and um, the cooperative that I'm here representing is the Kids Co-op, um, and it's designed to help um, young Greenbelters continue the community's cooperative heritage by learning about co-ops and by eating, he learn how to eat healthy, and get lots of activity by actually running and forming, forming and running their own um, worker co-ops. And the initial one that we have in mind is a. Uh, smoothie co-op in which they they blend the smoothies using bicycle power and they would be selling these smoothies at the farmers market and other activities and events around the community okay and kim you have some some ideas too something that's needed yeah basically a thrift shop because i i noticed one day 
you know, like if I wanted to buy, you know, go to a thrift shop, I had to go to Laurel or Langley Park. And yet there's very few thrift shops in, you know, in Greenbelt. And, and the, the other thing about, the th um, well, the other thing is that, you know, we have a lot of unemployed people, underemployed people, retirees living on fixed income. And I think they probably would appreciate having something they could purchase for, you know, less than full retail price. Oh, yes. So it would benefit then the consumer because they, they could get these um, products or things that they needed for less money yeah. and, and also probably benefit people who wanted to get rid of their junk. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, they, they always say one, man's, one person's trash, trash is another person's treasure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I do want to find out how does compost help our highway? Well, there's a new product. It's called a compost sock where it's a, it's a type of a fabric that you fill it with compost and you put it on the side of a highway. So when, you, when you're doing a construction project, so you won't have erosion on the side of the road mm -hmm. and, and, and dirt all over the road. So actually there's a law, um, I think it's um, in the Maryland le legislature, about um, asking the State Highway Administration to investigate the use of compost on their, all their highway projects. Okay. So that will also drive up the demand for compost. So. Yes, it would. Because if everybody in the state of Maryland is composting their food scraps, that's going to be a lot of compost. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that, that's some very interesting ideas. And how did we come about uh, thinking of the ideas and the needs of Greenbelt? This, this started quite a couple years ago, the Greenbelt Co-op Incubator Group. Uh, and uh, Laura, you, you started this, you called this group together. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Well, some of us were reading um, various books. Uh, Maggie and I were in a group where we were learning about sacred economics. And then uh, some of us were learning about a gentleman named Gar Alperovitz, who was teaching people about this model that comes from Spain, from Mondragon, about worker cooperatives. And so a few of us went up to hear Gar Alperovitz in Baltimore I said, well, wow, I mean, Greenbelt, we have so many consumer cooperatives, but we don't have worker cooperatives where they're democratically run, the employees get to make the decisions about the business, about their salary, about how the, the, the profit is reinvested and so forth. So we just, we asked around who was interested and uh, about 30 people have expressed some interest and we finally uh, narrowed it down to these six ideas that we're working on now. But we're hoping others will come up with other worker cooperative or consumer co-op ideas for the future, as you said, to meet the needs of Greenbelt mm -hmm. in the 21st century. And there is uh, another co-op. I do want to mention the Greenbelt Early Learning Cooperative. Uh, this is uh, Carolyn and uh, Nicole and uh, Charlie, uh, Lois, uh, people from Franklin Park, the apartment community. Uh, they are thinking that, you know, we, we don't have enough preschool cooperatives. We don't have enough child care. We have the Greenbelt Nursery School here in the community center, and I've interviewed them for the, these um, uh, co-op interviews, and, and they have a waiting list. So there is a need for more. There's a need for more, and Carolyn and others in Franklin Park uh, have uh, expressed the idea that we need to have a nursery school or child care cooperative in Franklin Park, and they're calling that the Greenbelt Early Learning Cooperative that they're working on setting up. So, so a, a lot of different ideas. And now I know that many of you are talking about a worker cooperative, and what does that mean to you, a worker cooperative? What are you thinking that will be for you? Are you going to be working in the compost field, or what, is, <laughs> what are you... Well, yeah, um, so our idea for the Greenbelt Compost Co-op is that we would recruit at least four or five people who wanted um, basically an outdoor job where they would be collecting food scraps and uh, processing it with wood chips and turning it into, a, into compost. So there's two of us so far and we're hoping at least to recruit maybe four or five other people. Um, it's kind of similar to being a farmer, you know, it's an outdoor job and it, um, our, our goal is to do it all a fossil fuel free so we wouldn't be using any tractors or bulldozers. It would all be hand tools, you know, pitchforks and shovels. So. Well, that sounds like the way Greenbelt was built. Yeah. You remember, and I know you're, you're familiar with, during the Great Depression, we, we built Greenbelt, and we're going to do it all with hand tools. At one point, they said, uh, I was talking to some of the people who were on the first project building Greenbelt, 
someone said, well, the theater, you know, we could, we could use some machines to put on the roof. And someone said, no, we're using wheelbarrows because we have to put people to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that sounds just like that. Um, now, Maggie, I think you're talking about somehow a multi-stakeholder co-op. Can you yeah, tell us about um, that? We've been thinking about HACO as being sort of a hybrid that would be a consumer co-op and a workers co-op. And um, I think one of the, we, we think that there are going to be some people who would be interested in joining this as a co-op um, and would want to be in, most, most of the time people are involved in their own yard care. And so we were thinking of this as something where the workers would, in some cases they might do all of the work in a, in a given yard in other cases they would work with the person um, and we're also experimenting with um, sort of a gift economy as well and maybe a time back economy so that we're not just thinking about a monetary exchange in all cases we're 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 evolving in in the sense of, of what this is going to be um, so we would hope that eventually we could uh, support um, people who would want to do this at least part-time the other um, thing that HACO is interested in is having a special mission towards um, people who might have a disability and, and, and also thinking about senior citizens who might want to work part-time and thinking of this as a really healthy way to, to work um, and people who might have spent their whole lives, as I have, pretty much sitting in front of a computer who want to stay healthy, stay active, and gardening is a, is a really good way to do this. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we're exploring what this is actually going to be in terms of mm -hmm. a worker, producer, um, consumer co-op. And do the two of you think with composting and with healthy yards that there might be an opportunity for collaboration? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Tim, the kids co-op. Uh, that that's kind of got a couple different layers too with the the uh, students and then the adults how does that how do you envision that working well um, the primary mission is to help kids form co-ops the the actual organization of kids dot co-op um, is still in in flux um, uh, but basically it's a group of adults here in um, Greenbelt that have a variety of experiences that they can help um, share and uh, support in support of the kids forming their co-ops. People who have been working in co-ops, people at the credit union have financial um, management experience, um, people at a bike shop that have you know uh, bike trailing uh, hauling experience. Um, uh, you know, just a whole variety of different people who have expressed interest in helping out, helping the kids learn all about. Uh, co-ops and um, philanthropy, giving back to the community as part of doing business, um, dynamic governance, which is a way of making decisions um, as a group, um, things like financial literacy, entrepreneurship, um, you know, through the process of making smoothies, they're going to have to develop and, you know, recipes by testing and getting acquainted with some maybe different kinds of uh, ingredients that, that they may not have had, had come across before. Um, by connection with a farmer's market, more connection with what's being grown locally, and also using bicycles for all aspects of getting to and from meetings as a group, also to actually haul the smoothie stand on a bike trailer to events. So it, it, they get an idea of you know, ways that you can use a bicycle so you become more independent as a young person, but also it's good for the environment and good for your health. Hmm. So it's all kind of blended together, pardon my Fine. <laughs> but would yeah. they get paid to work at the, uh, at the farm? It would be their right? business, right. so they would determine how much they're paid. Um, and I'm looking at ages 10 to 14, and these are kids that tend to be shut out of the labor market unless they work on a farm, because the labor laws don't allow it. But if you're self-employed, there isn't an age limit. So for them to be able to do this is a great opportunity for them to get their feet wet in, what, in the real world. And also, um, I'm hoping meet a lot of great adults in the community and build their own community so they feel like a real sense of place here. Um, and the other the piece, uh, the idea for the business part itself didn't originate here in Greenbelt. It was from when I was doing youth entrepreneurship work up in Massachusetts 
I was doing a workshop and one of my colleagues sat in and came up with that, shared that idea with me. But when I came down here a couple of years ago and moved here a year ago, I, re I looked at the history of Greenbelt and realized that the very first co-op in Greenbelt was in fact run by, started by school children. It was 100 kids started the Gumdrop Co-op um, here in this very building in the community center to um, access lower cost candy and school supplies. <laughs> candy you know you really need that <laughs> yeah. but it was um, it was went on to the uh, Associated Press and it was put in articles all over the country um, in 1937-38 and they heard their parents talking about co-ops um, in the planning stages and that's what gave them the idea that that's what they should do okay. so it's not a new thing no. for Greenbelt <laughs> but as, as I say, back to the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, talking about movies, Caitlin, what are you planning? And a little bit more about, I think you have sort of a multi uh, two part uh, plan for, for your activity. Yeah, my interest in, in co ops for the theater also came about from the history of Greenbelt and the theater because it was originally run as a cooperative. And so when I was thinking about what would be best for the theater and how to really make it as as um, as functional as possible for our community and, and to do as much for our community, I uh, came across the idea of the co-op as a way of really foregrounding community involvement so that we could have volunteerism, but that also people feel that they are um, democratically involved in the running of the theater and that there's transparency and that we have a, a kind of um, equality and openness to the structure that um, seems like would be beneficial. So that's where the workers cooperative piece comes in on the running of the theater. And then the friends group would in a lot of ways be modeled on a consumer cooperative in that people would be members and they would also have a voice in that way that they could um, give input, they could be committees on what people would like to see come to the theater, what kinds of outreach programs they'd like to see us do, and um, and also to be involved in a, uh, in a in a volunteer way. Mm -hmm. Now, Kim, do you have any um, any thoughts on how to get your idea off the ground? What are you What are you thinking? Well, originally the idea was to take over the the, the space where the post office was, but then the church took it over, and now we're you know talk about you know, maybe maybe involving the idea maybe a, a flea market. Mm -hmm. But the you know I visit various flip, you know thrift shops, and it's the biggest hurdle is space. Because you need store space for like out of season items. Because you know thrift shops, the thrift shops I visit, you know they, they know like not to put sweaters out in August. Mm -hmm. You know because you, you know you, basically they, or not the you know or like put Valentine's Day out, stuff out in February. So that's probably um, you know that 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 is probably like the biggest hurdle right now is finding space. Okay. Oh, it always seems to be a hurdle finding space. Uh, yeah, and affordable space. Affordable is even better. Yeah. Yes. And I know that I've been talking with the people at the uh, Greenbelt Early Learning Cooperative that that's, that's been their, uh, their big challenge is to find space because they do want to be located in the Franklin Park apartment community because that's where they're getting uh, information and surveys that people need mm -hmm. this. Uh, but where do you put it? So that that is always always an issue. Now, um, what's what's next for your group? Yeah, well, tagging onto what you're saying about space, when you're doing composting, you also have to have space. And um, our, the Greenbelt Compost Co-op, we're pursuing a number of different avenues, um, using uh, people's yards where neighbors would be able to drop off in their yards but again it has to be a space that's um, centrally located but that also that the homeowners associations or whatever would approve of this or using a church or using a, a school or using a municipal property so we're we're experimenting with different models but again it will all come down to you know uh, where will the neighbors think that this is a good idea so finding space is is, uh, is key and important. Uh, of course, with your kids co-op, they're just going to be riding their bicycles all around. So yeah. <laughs> wherever they are is where it is, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's nice. We have a lot of room for expansion on this business model. So if one group of kids is successful doing it, I could see other groups of kids doing it because we have farmers markets at NASA. We have two in College Park. We have a couple in Hyattsville. 
um, and we have a slew of community events here in Greenbelt, and we're based actually at Greenbelt Makers Space, and there's a space right in front, outdoors, outside, that's covered, mm -hmm. um, similar to the, the New Deal ca Cafe, which has outdoor seating, that space that, that's part of their, their space, and the Maker Space also has that space, so we're welcome to use that to set up for events or, or what have you and, and be protected by the elements at the same time. Mm -hmm. So. And, and Tim, aren't, aren't you also trying to involve all three parts of Greenbelt? Yeah, we're, we're um, actively uh, looking to include kids from the center of Greenbelt, Old Greenbelt, and Greenbelt West and Greenbelt East. And we've already done a presentation over in um, the Franklin Park area. And so we're really, uh, that's been one of the things that's come across, uh, come up in numerous things that I've been involved with since I've come to Greenbelt is how those, those highways have, have divided Greenbelt into these three different sort of pie pieces. And they're not always, um, it's not easy logistically to connect. And in fact, that issue we were talking about earlier about, you know, just the lights, the traffic lights and the walkways, there's, you know, for kids to even ride their bikes from Franklin Park to Old Greenbelt, to get down and see a movie, for example, or go to a festival, it's dangerous on the roads. Sure. So we're going to have to, we actually have a couple of adults that are, you know, master bicyclists, <laughs> if you will, that are going to be chaperones so that the kids get used to knowing how to ride, which routes and the rules of the road and all that sort of thing so that hopefully we'll, we'll create a crop of people that see these kids riding their bikes and, and getting around to different parts of Greenbelt and will be inspired to do the same. So you have uh, envisioned that adults will be very much involved in, in this uh, kids co-op. It's, it's going to be adults also helping, or are the adults going to be workers? Well, that's something that I'm trying to figure out right now. Um, it's, it's probably going to end up being more of a loose-knit group of adults um, who are educators and pe people who have expertise in various uh, areas or who bring certain resources or connections. Um, whatever we can do to introduce our kids to, you know, adults doing good things here in the community and learning from them, they're going to, it's just, it, it's going to make a program that's going to be so much richer than, than, you know, that I could do by myself uh, or, um, and I'm not sure that it's, it's financially feasible to, to have a worker co-op. Uh, it may be more of the, the kids co-op as a, as a nonprofit, but our mission is to spin off kids owning their own cooperatives. Okay. I always want to keep the focus on the kids. The adults are there to help, the, the help facilitate their success. Because you're, you're, you're meeting the needs of that, that age group that's often overlooked, so, that, so that's important. Yeah. That's a good point because there's a lot of, I've seen there's a lot of activities for young children and then there's sports and other things for teenagers, but it's that, those gap years <laughs> that, that you see a whole fall off of, of other kinds of programming other than sports, so, yeah. yeah I was just going to say next steps for the, um, the HACO co-op, I think, are to start really holding regular meetings. We have a list of about 20 families that have expressed some interest in, in this. And one of the things that I think we were, officially we're a project of Cheers, the nonprofit Cheers. And so another project of Cheers is the Three Sisters Gardens, which is in the different areas of Greenbelt. And so we're hoping that we can kind of uh, co-develop with this mm -hmm. project and, and leverage some of the interest and the volunteers that we have for that, for that project as well. Um, and also with the with the um, <laughs> with the compost co-op because right, right, right. we have a lot of interests. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to just say about the um, the co-op incubator group is I think it's really um, been a real beneficial support group uh, for each of us. I mean, I think we we really support each other, and and so that for me that's been a really um, helpful thing in terms of trying to keep this project going and, and develop it is just getting the ideas. And so I think that's part of the next step is really participating in that group as well. And oftentimes when you see a, a co-op fail, uh, one of the reasons could be burnout. And so with, with the incubator group supporting each other and having regular meetings, that, that is important. I think you, you touched on something very, very, very important. 
And I think the next thing the, the incubator group is t planning to do with um, the funding that they got from the Greenbelt Community Foundation is to have some workshops to make sure that you know, uh, you know how to write a business plan, what should be in your bylaws, what are your various model options. Uh, is, is that not the case? Yeah, we'll be starting those workshops at the end of this year in November and December. The right. first two of four, possibly five. Because one of the things that I've learned actually from Ben Fischler, who's one of um, my partner in the compost co-op, is there's really three parts. You have to know your craft. So in our case, we have to learn about composting. You have to learn about business, how to write a business plan. But you also have to learn how does a cooperative differ from just you know just a standard business. And so many of us have been pursuing the theater, the landscaping, how to turn bananas into smoothies, but now, <laughs> but now we have to figure out, okay, well, what, what is specific to being a, a co-op? How do you register with the state, with the IRS? How do you write bylaws, articles of incorporation, business plans? And so the goal is um, between now and I think it's July of next year, that we'll all have that uh, ability to learn all the steps involved. It doesn't mean that next July we're all going to march to the IRS and, you know, um, and register, but that we'll have the skills. And so uh, we've, um, we've engaged our peer advisor, Jim Johnson, as well as some students from the University of Bar Baltimore uh, Law Clinic to help teach us the various skills we need to know. And, uh, and then we all have our homework cut out for us <laughs> over the next couple of months to, to actually, you know, make, even if it's just a, a like a sample bylaws, articles of incorporation, business plan. So, and I think we even talked about helping each other fill out some of those, those, uh, those forms, like those IRS, IRS. forms. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, right. yeah. That's been one of the great benefits of, of being in the incubator group for me is that I think we're all trying really hard to make sure that we get it right and so that we go through the process in, in the right um, order and that we make sure that we have all the information we need so that that's, you know, that we can ensure as much as we can the each individual co-op success. So we'll be hearing, I, I'm sure we'll be hearing more of these six potential co-ops in uh, the next year. And anyone who, who didn't learn enough today and really wants to know more and, and wants to volunteer to help, maybe even you know participate or provide some funding, because funding is also always a problem for co-ops, uh, I would suggest that they go and email uh, the group. And that your email is the Greenbelt co-op incubator at gmail.com, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Any last words from anyone? No, just thanks for the opportunity yeah. to share. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming and talking. And as I said, this is really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.